This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. For animal lovers, by animal lovers. My name is Brian Barczyk. I've been working with exotic animals for over 25 years. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This week, I'm in Owasso, Michigan at Josh's Frogs. You're watching Snake Bites. I'm in Owasso, Michigan, visiting Josh's frogs. Now, I've always been an amphibian nut, but the truth is I have a lot to learn. And I tell you what, a place like Josh's, one of the biggest amphibian breeders in the entire country, certainly is the perfect place to learn. This is gonna be absolutely awesome. Hey, Brian. Nice Zach, to what's you. going on, man? Hey, Thanks so much, no worries. man. Come on in. Awesome, dude. So coming in here, obviously, you walk around and you just see so many different amphibians, and I know I'm going to learn a lot today, but let's start with the basics. Number one, Zach, what do you do here at Josh's Frog? It's, how long have you been here? Um, I started with Josh in 2007. Um, the company originally started in 2004, so pretty early on. Um, initially, I was hired just to do some reptile shows, um, help build naturalistic vivaria, the habitats for the frogs we sell here for customers. And as the company grew, um, at that point we were at three employees, now we're up to about 17. Took on more of a managerial role, um, overseeing all of the animal care, um, and then also our online presence, social media. But one thing I want to cover, you know, uh, you know, so that the people watching understand, if you walk in here and you see the tanks the way they are, you know, maybe some people might think, gosh, they don't even clean these things. So tell me what's the deal with the algae on these tanks. Well, I'll answer your question with a question, Brian. Do you have blinds on your bedroom window? Of course. So do our frogs. They just prefer algae. Algae is completely harmless. It just grows on the glass, and it makes our frogs feel a lot more secure in there. Having algae on the fronts of the cages keeps the stress down for these frogs. You can kind of think of it as a hide box for snakes. But of course, if you keep these as pets, you can certainly keep the front of the glasses clean. This is really just for breeding purposes. When Brian was younger, he kept a few dark frogs. What species do you think he worked with? A, Aratus, B, Azurius, or C, Leucamelis? Go ahead and answer down below in the comments and check back later in the show to see if you have the right answer. For this week's Reptile Report, we'll be highlighting monitor lizards. Go ahead and check out the URL down below or click on the link in the description. So what would you say Josh's Frog's mission statement is? Um, our mission statement is to only provide healthy captive bred animals. Um, currently we only sell animals we produce here ourselves. Um, and carry all of the supplies you need to properly care for that animal um, its entire lifespan. Um, long term, we're really, really hoping to reduce the demand for wild caught animals. Right. Um, if they can be bred here, they should be bred here. Right. Um, and get their prices in captivity low enough to where they can actually successfully outcompete um, lower cost wild caught imports that are coming in. Um, we're really strong believers in um, conservation through commercialization. If we can produce them here, you know, there's no need to bring them from out there. It takes the pressure off. And, and I think with, you know, more so with amphibians than reptiles, right? I mean, that, that importing from most species is probably really bad. Am I not right? It is, especially when you're dealing with an imported animal. Not only are you, you know, that animal, you're taking it out of the wild. You're, re, you know, removing it from that wild population and its chances to produce offspring and everything. Um, they don't handle shipping as well. Right. Um, they are susceptible to parasites. Um, a lot. Of, they may be very well diseased. A lot of these animals that come in wild caught are in rough shape. And even in the best of hands, they have virtually no shot of staying alive, much less surviving to produce healthy captive bred animals of their own. If I was going to buy my very first dart frog, walk me through what animal you'd want me to buy and how I'm going to keep it. Yeah, there are three, we call them the big three. There are three great species. They're mainstays in a hobby. They're widely available captive bred from us or elsewhere. Um, Dendrobates tinctorius, um, commonly called the dying poison arrow frog, because it actually used to be thought that you could boil these animals and <laughs> use them to dye clothing, believe it or not. <laughs> I tried um, that once. Dendrobates erratus, um, the Costa Rican green and black poison dart frog, which honestly the vast majority of them aren't green and black. Okay. Or Dendrobates leucomelis, which is one of my favorites. It's called the bumblebee poison dart frog. Um, it's generally black and yellow. Um, any of those frogs are very, very easy to keep alive um, through their full 15, 20 plus year lifespan if you take good care of them. Well, Zach, just show me some, uh, some cool frogs, all right? So we have Tinctorius azurius here. So tell me a little bit about these guys other than the fact that they're absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, they absolutely are gorgeous. They certainly earned the, um, the moniker the sky blue poison dart frog. Um, blue is a really rare, rare color in the animal world and they certainly display it. Um, these are, like you said, Dendrobates, Tinctorius azurius, the blue poison arrow frog. 
They're a great example of a very variable Tinctoria species. Um, they're over from Brazil, a lot of them are from Suriname, um, a few neighboring countries. Um, this is a male and a female pair. How do you know, I mean, is there sexual dimorphism? I mean, what are you looking at to know which one's a male and female? There's actually, absolutely is sexual dimorphism, even though it's not as evident with these guys as it is with a lot of other herps out there. Um, the female is much, you know, with these guys being about the same age, the female is much larger. Okay. She also has a much more, um, arched back. It's very, very hunchback, where a male's going to have a much more smoother back when seen in side profile. And the front toe pads in the male are going to be a little bit larger, mm -hmm. and they're going to be heart-shaped. There's going to be a little bit, a little divot okay. between each little toe pad there. Now this is, uh, you know, a relatively large species, right? Yeah, they're, um, of the Tinctorius, they can be fairly large. Of the different morphs of Tinctorius, Azurius are a fairly medium size out of there. So you're looking at anywhere from, with some of the smaller morphs, about an inch, an inch and a quarter, up to about two and a half inches. They're some oh, of the okay. larger dart frog species. What, what's so cool about these animals? Um, Dendrobates erratus are a Central American dart frog. Um, they do great in groups. You really rarely see aggression between males and females, or more typically with dart frogs, females and females among them. Um, in the wild, they're actually found typically near slow-moving bodies of water, such as streams, or really, really humid, wet, damp areas. Um, they're naturally a little bit shyer than a lot of the other frogs out there, but if you provide them with a humid environment with plenty of hides, where they, you know, if they get startled, they know they can disappear out of sight real quick, but kind of risk venturing out in the open a little bit more, and you'll see them. Um, Aratus is kind of unusual because Aratus, R-O, gold. The original um, holotype of Aratus that was described was actually a gold animal, which is a specific population that's actually incredibly rare in the hobby. So you're calling it Dendrobates Aratus, which is tree walker gold and Virtually none of the frogs in the hobby are gold, so you get these green and black guys instead. Yeah, now are all the erratus black and gold? Or any uh, black, black and green? And green? Um, absolutely not. We have you can get blue and black. Um, one of my okay. favorite um, populations are called the El Cope, um, which is from an area in Panama where they can their base color can be anywhere from turquoise to green to blue, and then their colors, um, their little um, they can have dots or lines that can be black or. Most of them tend to be more bronzish, which can take on almost a grayish overtone with age. These guys, inch, inch and a quarter as adults? Inch, inch and a quarter. They're a good, moderately sized dart frog. They're not super tiny, but they're not too big either. Okay, feeding these guys? Um, pretty much your typical dart frog fare. Um, like most dart frogs, um, Aratus are mycophagus. They're really not going to be interested in eating anything over about an eighth of an inch. Right. In the wild, they'll eat a lot of ants, termites, beetles, Lord knows what else. Um, in captivity, we're feeding them mostly fruit flies or um, pinhead crickets. So just really small prey small dusted prey. with a you know, multivitamin calcium supplement. Now, uh, that food source, they can get that through Josh's Frogs? Yep. Yeah, and we sell the fruit fly cultures. We're actually the largest producer of 32 ounce fruit fly cultures in the U.S. Um, we also sell all the, the culture materials you need to actually produce yours at home as well. Right. And we breed fruit flies and they're wingless, so right. they don't have the wings. Makes right. life a little bit easier for you. <laughs> don't have to worry about them attacking your, your yeah, vegetables. Exactly. A no, yeah, little bit easier to get past the wife. So. All right, let's move on. All right, yeah, and here we have Dendrobates leucomelis, um, what's commonly known in the hobby as the bumblebee poisoned art frog. The vast majority of the leucomelis in the hobby are from Venezuela that came in in the 90s, early 2000s. Even though recently we've actually been getting a lot of different neat types from um, British Guiana. Um, here's a male and a female. They're a good group frog. Um, we keep them in pairs here just for efficiency as far as producing offspring. Um, the worst females are going to do to each other is eat each other's eggs. Okay. They have a nice loud call. They're fairly bold. Um, they're also, you know, more of an arboreal dart frog. They'll st spend a lot of the time given the chance off the substrate, moving around, using the entire, you know, volume of the tank. Now, is this a typical pattern, and is there a lot of variability? Um, there is a ton of variability. Um, most of the common leucomelis you see out there are from Venezuela, but they may very well be a mix of different locales and different import years that have come in through the, through the years. So a lot of them can be pretty variable. Um, these are your more typical Venezuelan leucomelis, black and yellow bands with a little bit of spotting involved there. Um, we also have morphs that are just straight banded animals from British Guiana, which adults are nearly twice this size that have very, very clean yellow and black bands. Okay, so same species, mm -hmm. just quite a bit bigger. Oh yeah, quite a bit bigger. We have some that are also um, nearly two-thirds the size as adults oh. that are um, fine spot leucomelis. And it's an actual southern Venezuelan morph that has, you know, basically you end up with an orangish yellow frog with itty bitty black dots. Oh. The bands break up as they get older and you get more spots and less bands. Um, now, do you see much production uh, difference between, say, a rotus and a leucomelis? Yeah, leucomelis are definitely a much more seasonal animal. Okay. They're going to produce um, Generally smaller egg clutches, four to six is pretty common. Some okay. of the bigger ones like the bandits can produce in the, in the low teens or so. Okay. But you know, a clutch every um, week and a half to three weeks or so. 
um, for, you know, maybe four, five, six clutches in a row, a break for several months, and then they go back to breeding. Um, in the wild where they're from, there tends to be a pretty well-defined wet and a dry season. Okay. So definitely a much more seasonal breeder than a lot of the other dart frogs. Now, do you guys give them that type of thing, or are they kept the same all year um, round? We give them that type of thing to a degree. Um, yeah. Honestly, with this, you know, us being in Michigan, there's going to be a little bit of a temperature and humidity difference as the furnace and the AC is running and all that. Right. That kind of does that for us. Um, that's one reason why we have a bunch of these is right. so we can still, you know, hopefully keep them in stock year round because gotcha. some will be taking a break while some aren't. Now, you know, the thing I'm amazed about with, with dart frogs in particular is the reproduction. It's just a lot different than a lot of the other frogs, yeah, right? I mean, they, they uh, you know, tell me a little bit about the fact, I mean, low production typically as far as the numbers, um, males carry the tadpoles on their back. I mean, mm -hmm. tell me about that. Yeah, dart frogs are really, really odd in that regard. They're certainly not the typical frog we're used to seeing that shows up at a pond, dumps off a few thousand eggs, and then leaves. These guys will lay small clutches of eggs on land, um, generally on a leaf or a smooth surface like that. In captivity, we trick them into laying on a petri dish underneath a coconut hut. As those eggs develop, the male will actually guard the eggs, come back, and he's not really urinating on them, but he drops water off to keep them moist. Then once they hatch into tadpoles, he'll kick them on his back, the tadpoles climb up, and I'll actually take them and transport them to a water source. Um, some of the um, dart frogs like these um, Ranitomea ventromiculata over here, which are, yeah, fancy name, right? It's a little <laughs> spotted frog. They're called thumbnail dart frogs. Um, okay. They're also known as non-obligate egg eaters. They'll actually come back and the female will lay infertile eggs. She'll stick her butt in the back of the water there. If the tadpole's hungry, it'll come up and rub up against it. And she'll lay infertile eggs that the tadpole can feed off of until it morphs out into a small frog. Ah, so what's the deal with this room? This is our tree frog room. We have a wide variety of species of tree frogs here, um, as well as a lot of special projects at Josh's okay. Frogs. There's odd and end frogs that do well with a 78 degree temperature and about 70-80% ambient humidity we maintain in this room. Uh, what's the coolest thing you've got going on right now in this room? The coolest room? thing we've got going on is that guy right over there. You mean the guy or the frog? Well, the guy on the guy. Ah, I see. Or the girl on the guy, it's actually, being a, wait, it's, a female. It's not this type of show, it's the wrong show. What, what kind of frog is this? That is a Pedostibes hosei, the Asian yellow spotted climbing toad. The only true arboreal toad species in the wild. Um, they have large legs, large arms, and freakishly long fingers that they can grasp and climb really well. So you guys have had some pretty good success with these guys, huh? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, this last season we just had the largest success, to our knowledge, any of them in captivity before. Um, we expect over the next month or two to be able to release about 200 offspring into the pet trade. Wow. There's actually more than have probably ever been imported from Malaysia into the United States. This happens to be one of my favorite frogs of all time. It's the milk frog. And of course, they're called a milk frog because they secrete a substance that looks milky, but I'm told it doesn't taste very good. They used to actually be called a golden mission frog because of the gold in their eyes. But these guys are really interesting when it comes to breeding because they're a tree hole breeder. But what's cool about it is that the male will fertilize one clutch of eggs up to 700 eggs more typically three or four hundred but then he tricks another female into breeding but doesn't fertilize her eggs so when she lays that clutch the tadpoles from the first clutch can actually eat the infertile eggs now, i tell you what mother nature is truly amazing and these guys absolutely are stunning certainly one of the most interesting frogs that I've seen today are these Solomon leaf frogs. Tell me a little bit about these guys. Yeah, these guys are awesome. They're leaf litter frogs. They live at the bottom of the rainforest. They mimic dead leaves. They come in all different colors. This here you can see a, a red and a yellow one, but you can get green ones, brown ones. They really just blend right into the leaves. Oh, I tell you, if you were walking in the woods, you would never think that's a frog. I no, mean, you, you absolutely. Would, it totally looks like two different leaves. That's It's amazing. And uh, you guys have been successful breeding them, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, they're not commonly bred in captivity, um, which it's unfortunate because one of the neatest things about them is their mode of reproduction. They have what's referred to as direct development. They basically skip a tadpole stage. Really? Yep. The feet, they'll dig down about two to three inches and bury a clutch of eggs, generally anywhere from 20 up to 60 eggs for a really big female. And then two to three months later, the little frogs will hatch right out of the eggs. So these are going to lay the eggs, and the eggs are, what are they going to look like? Um, they're going to look like little brown peas. They're actually uh. translucent, and you can, if you rinse them off, you can see the little frog developing right in there. But they're a little sticky, so they're really good about taking any particulate from the environment around them, thus you know, camouflaging them a little bit more. And they don't need any water when they lay that no, egg right on the ground? absolutely not. Yeah, pretty cool <sighs> That's animals. That's pretty cool. 
Now these incredible vivariums are really interesting because they're little ecosystems that really require almost no maintenance whatsoever, which makes them incredible for keeping amphibians. I want to break down exactly how the system works right now. This is actually a substrate right here that's called Josh's Frog's False Bottom. Basically all that does is just give the water an area to drain through because obviously if you have too much dampness on the soil, you're going to have a lot of issues and you're going to have a lot of maintenance. Right here is just a little bit of a cloth or a weed barrier that basically just keeps all the material on top from falling down into this false bottom. Then you actually have a product that's a soil that's called ABG that is perfect for the plants growing. On top of that, sphagnum moss and leaf litter. Now living in this are going to be little springtail and isopods, which are basically little tank maintenance bugs, which is pretty cool. And they're going to break down all the frog waste and everything else and basically keep this whole ecosystem as clean as possible. So with the exception of having to do some maintenance maybe every six months or maybe even every year, this is completely self-sustaining, which makes it incredible. And look at how absolutely beautiful it is. So I'm taking this as the tadpole room? This is the infamous tadpole room. Yes. Where the magic happens. So Absolutely. Tell me some stuff well, it about happens this. in that room, but then the babies <laughs> are raised up in here. This is where our frogs get to college before they're exactly. sold. Exactly, the nursery. Exactly. Nursery, yes. So tell me, uh, what, I mean, well, you've got some tanks here. I see you have a bunch of cups. What, what's the process? Absolutely. Well, here, over here is where most of our non dart frog tadpoles live. Most okay. of those tadpoles can be raised communally. Okay. So we rear them in tanks, you know, just like you would an aquarium with sponge filters water changes. Yeah, and then this 40 breeder right here is where we breed our bumblebee toads. We just bring adults in that have been cycled in the other room. They think it's the rainy season. The females are full of eggs. The males are calling their heads off. So we pop them in one of these with a few pieces of cork for them to hang out on. Mm -hmm. They mate. They lay their eggs in the water. Um, then we pull the adults out and raise the tadpoles up right in the tank. Gotcha. Now how long are, are you literally going to leave them in the tank until they have legs? Or? Exactly. Until With these guys specifically, they can come out of the water on their own. Okay. They're not like dark frog tadpoles where okay. we have to remove from the water. So we set it up in a way where as they get older, we reduce the water level and then they actually clam up on the glass on the gotcha. piece of the cork right there. Alright, so, so that's this, now with dart frogs you talked about, you actually move them into these type of settings? Exactly. Um, most dart frog species, the tadpoles tend to be cannibalistic. Right. So we don't want them eating each other, that's kind of bad for business. So we'll take dart frogs and we house them in, e in an individual cup. Okay. Um, each of these around here, each one of these gray bins has about 12 dart frogs in it. Okay. And every week they get fed and they get a little bit of a water change. Speaking of water, I mean, what's the system with water here? Um, we use reconstituted RO water. Um, we don't want to use tap water. We want to make sure that there's little or no minerals to it. You know, most of these animals are from the jungle. There's not a lot of minerals in that water, of course. They're dealing mainly with rainfall. So we reconstitute it. We add back. Um, Tannin, um, Indian almond leaf extract back into it to lower the pH, um, the style upon it, natural antibacterial and antifungal properties, make it just right for the amphibians that Josh's frogs need to thrive. So, so this is the final stage, right? Yep, absolutely. After the tadpoles have four legs, and our, we call them froglets here, mm -hmm. baby frogs, um, we drain most of their water out and angle them so they can actually leave the water on their own. Just like, like this little guy right that here. little guy right there. Then they'll absorb their tail, use that for nutrients for a few days, and then they're off to the froglet room to be rid up into a happy, healthy frog for sale. You know, the thing that I love about this type of a show is, is basically the nuts and bolts of what happens here. It goes from one room to the next system to the next system. And, and you guys have really figured it out probably down to the best science possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. And even then, even though we have a really firm grasp on this, we're constantly analyzing what we're doing, trying to make it better. We want to make the, the largest, healthiest frog possible. Well, this has been absolutely awesome. And if you guys want to learn more about Josh's Frogs, make sure to check them out at joshesfrogs.com. There's a ton of really great resources there, whether you're an experienced frog keeper or a budding little frog nut like I think I'm about to be. And if you want to join a cool community, check them out on Facebook too at Josh's Frogs. I tell you, Zach, this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for having yeah, us. Not a problem, Brian. Thanks to have you. Bye. When Brian was younger, he kept a few dart frogs. What species do you think he worked with? If you said A, Aratus, you're 100% correct. Good job. So there it is. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I certainly got my frog freak on, that's for sure. And as always, I was Facebooking and tweeting my way through it. So make sure to follow me over at Snake Bites TV. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. And in fact, these guys exist in the northern rainforest from Cairns all the way up through into Cook County. A very restricted range, but absolutely an amazing animal. Covered with all these beautiful spines 
in this beautiful mottling colour. This is ABTV.